I'm hungry. Hola, señora. Señorita. Bonjour. Yo no hablo mucho español esta semana Okay, I think I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, all right, class. Um, so the topic of today's lesson is something called angular momentum. Uh, which is denoted by L. Okay. And um, so angular momentum in some sense uh, quantifies the amount of spinning. Whatever that means to you. Okay. Um, really the best way to explain what angular momentum is is to give it a mathematical definition. Okay, but, but if we're trying to give some intuitive sense of what angular momentum means, it's somehow the amount of spinning in a system. Okay, um, so let's go ahead and consider maybe a uh, an object that's moving in a circle. Okay, so let, let's consider an object moving in a circle and we have a 3D view of that circle. Okay, um, so a 3D view of a circle, it'll kind of look like an oval, something like that. And um, you have a particle that's moving around the circle. And that particle has a certain um, position vector. So we'll call that R. And it has a certain velocity vector, V, as it goes around. OK? Um, so the, the mathematical definition of angular momentum is a cross product of the position vector with the momentum vector of the particle. Okay, so this is the mathematical definition of angular momentum. Now, uh, if you recall, momentum is mass times velocity, so I could also think of it as r cross mv. And by the way, when, when we are 
if someone just said momentum to you, you should think P equals MV. But uh, w when we're having a conversation where both angular momentum and regular momentum are in play, uh, we will sometimes distinguish it by saying linear momentum. So you have, so P is the linear momentum, L is the angular momentum. So M is just a scalar, so we could factor that out of the cross product and just get M times the quantity R cross V. All right, so this is the, uh, the definition of angular momentum. Um, so if this is your, your object, say, moving in a circle, the angular momentum is going to point perpendicular to the plane of the orbit, okay? So for example, the angular momentum of the Earth points perpendicular to the Earth's uh, orbit about the solar system, okay? Um, and this is just because of the properties of the, the cross product. So the way the cross product works is that the cross product is perpendicular to both of the two vectors that it's made out of. So perpendicular to these two would have to be out of the plane. Um, if you have more than one mass, then the total angular momentum is going to be the sum, uh, the vector sum of the individual angular momenta. Okay. Um, so from this equation right here, we can actually um, determine the units of angular momentum quite easily. Hello, Hazel. What do you do? What do you do? What do you do, Hazel? Come. Hazel. Hello. Hello, Goofy Doofy. Uh, the units of angular momentum. So we can see angular momentum is a mass times a position times a velocity. So a mass is kilograms times a position is meters times a velocity is meters per second. So angular momentum is measured in, uh, so we have two factors of m. Uh, she do many. She do many. Kilogram meters squared per second are the units of angular momentum. Okay. Um, so why is angular momentum useful to define? All right. So to understand why angular momentum is useful to define, um, I'm going to go ahead and take uh, the derivative of the angular momentum with respect to time. Okay, so that's going to be the derivative, and I'm going to take the derivative. All three of these are the same thing, but um, just for the purposes of this calculation, I'm going to use that version. So that's going to be the derivative of m times r cross v with respect to time, okay? Now this is a product of three things. So I'm gonna use the product rule, okay? Um, so the product rule works equally well with vector products, but you have to keep the order of the vectors the same, okay? So, you know, if, if you were just doing regular product rule and you, you did um, uh, ddx of f times g, you could write that as, you know, f prime times g plus g prime times f. See how I reverse the order of f and g? But if you're doing it with vectors, um, because the vector product is depends on the order, um, you need to keep them in the same order, okay? So I'm going to keep all three of them in the same order. 
So dm dt times r cross v plus m times dr dt cross v plus um, uh, m v ooh, ooh, m r my bad cross d v d t okay um, now let me turn this light off because it's a little bit saturated um, when I say cross I mean uh, do the vector cross product with so if I say r cross v I mean r do the cross product of R with V. Okay, so the cross, when I say cross, it stands for the cross product symbol. Um, okay, so the mass of the particle is constant. So this first term is zero. All right, then we have M, uh, dr dt is just the velocity, V cross V. Now, who can tell me what is the cross product of any vector with itself? Type it in the chat if you know the answer. And then um, m times the quantity r cross the derivative of the velocity <clears throat> with respect to time is the acceleration. All right. Now I'll give you a hint with v cross v. What would be the magnitude? Of v cross v, it would be uh, the the way that cross products work is the magnitude of the cross product is the magnitude of the first vector times the magnitude of the second vector times the sine of the angle between them. Now, if these two are the same vector, they're parallel, and so the angle between them is zero. Okay the sine of zero is zero. So the magnitude of V cross with V is just zero, which means that the cross product is zero. Okay. Um, so that's a useful fact. Anytime you take the um, cross product of a vector with itself, you get zero. So this is zero. All right. Um, Exactly. So, and then I'm going to re-multiply this m back into the acceleration. Okay. So I get so the both of these first two terms are zero, and I get r cross m a. Now, according to Newton's second law, m a is net force. So you get r cross net force. Now, who can tell me what is R cross force? And I talked about this very briefly um, in a previous lesson. R cross force. R cross force. What is R cross force? Uh, torque, very good. So, um, this is the net torque. Okay, so you might recall that torque, the magnitude of the torque, um, is R times F perp. Um, and so uh, when you do, when you have the actual torque vector, it's R cross F, okay? 
So what I've just shown is that the derivative of the angular momentum with respect to time is equal to the net torque. Okay. Um, so in particular, uh, if there is no net torque, on the system, um, we have dl dt equals zero. All right? So this is only going to be true if there's no net torque on the system. Now, uh, let me ask you, type it into the chat if you know, what does it mean? What's a physics way of saying that something has zero time derivative. We talked about this with energy, we talked about it with momentum. So um, there's a, a, a special phrase that we use when something has zero time derivative. conserved. That's right. So, um, excellent. So that means that angular momentum is conserved. Okay. Which is, um, which is another way of saying that the initial angular momentum is equal to the final angular momentum. So, um, angular momentum is not automatically conserved, but if there is no net torque on the system, it is conserved. And so that is basically why angular momentum is a useful thing, because it, it is a constant of the system that allows us to solve problems more easily. Um, in this class, now if you, if you take a, a physics class in college, um, they might talk about the vector nature of angular momentum. Um, the, the vector na nature of angular momentum is um, can get a little bit confusing. Okay. Um, it allows you to understand things like the behavior of tops. So why does a top process as it spins? It spins about its axis, but then the axis of spinning rotates. That's called a precession. Um, angular momentum can help you understand things like that. Um, and that's just a little bit beyond the scope of this course because it involves a really strong um, grasp of vectors. And so um, in this class, only the magnitude of the angular momentum vector will be important. Okay. Um, so that, and I will denote that just by L without the arrow over the top of it. Okay. Um, and so the magnitude of the angular momentum vector, just like the magnitude of the torque vector, is going to be m v perp times r. All right, r cross f. The magnitude of r cross f is going to be r times f perp. The magnitude of r cross b p is going to be m v perp times r. So this is the formula for angular momentum for a point particle. All right. Um, and so we used this equation last year. Uh, if you have a rigid body, uh, you can take this formula and you can add it up for all of the different particles within the system. And you end up getting um, I times omega. So this is for a rigid body. So, um,
these are the two equations for angular momentum that we will have the most use for in this course. Um, all right. So let's do a couple of examples. Man, I'm so hungry right now. Last night I, I got some bologna. I've been craving bologna for some reason. So I got some bologna last night. I'm going to make myself a bologna sandwich. I think I might make myself two bologna sandwiches. All right. So um, let's do an example. And the example is going to be uh, a planet orbiting a star. in an elliptical orbit. Um, another way of saying that it's... Okay, I'm going to hang on a second because I think... Give me one second, class. Hazel, did you do a bath? Class, I have to let Hazel out because she had a big accident on uh, Wednesday, and I don't want to repeat that, so I'm going to let her out. So I'll be back in like two minutes. Come on, Hazel. Let's do it. Okay, um, yeah, she she had like a really bad smelling fart and then she came up to me and was looking at me and she does this thing where her her whole body trembles like she was just looking at me trembling and I was like, uh-oh, because she knows she's not supposed to have an accident, you know, so she gets really anxious when she, um, when she knows she did something wrong. Um, so anyways, crisis averted, I hope. Uh, another way of saying an elliptical orbit is to say that it is an eccentric orbit. Okay, so we have the star, all right? And um, so the planet is going around like so. So this is a top view of the orbit. And uh, as we learned, um, the, the sun is actually not in the center of the orbit. It's at one of the foci of the ellipse. Okay, So you got a planet that's going around um, all right, like that. Now there's a couple of special points in the orbit. One of the points is this point right here. And that's the point when the planet is farthest away from the star, okay? Um, and so that point is called the apoapsis. All right? Um, that's the, the farthest that a planet gets away from the star. And then there's this point right here, which is the closest that the planet gets to the star, 
and uh, this point is called the periapsis. All right, uh, apoapsis and periapsis. You probably know those terms if you played Kerbal Space Program. Um, so these are the general terms for it. But if you were talking about a planet orbiting um, the sun, for example, then this point uh, would be called the aphelion. Uh, this would be called the perihelion. So helios is the, the you know, one of the ways of saying the sun. Um, if we were talking about an orbit of a satellite around the Earth, so that the Earth is in the center, uh, this point right here would be called the apogee for geo, like geoid, Earth, um, geology. What are you doing, Hazel? I can just tell she wants to get into trouble. She's about to get into trouble. Why, why are you trembling? What do you do? Just sit. Do a sit. Um, see, look what I'm doing right here. What you do? What you do? Why you tremble? What's wrong? Oh. Oh, you poor baby. Um, or this is called the perigee. Okay, so in general, it's called apoapsis and periapsis. But um, uh, all right. So uh, let's suppose we looked at the planet when it's right here in its orbit. Its r vector would be like this. So here's its r vector. And its velocity vector is tangent to the orbit. So its velocity vector looks like that. All right? So notice how the velocity is not perpendicular to r. But if we think about the apoapsis, when it's at the apoapsis, here is the r vector. Um, and if we look at the velocity vector, it's straight up and down. OK? So notice how the, the velocity vector is perpendicular to r at the apoapsis, OK? And furthermore, the radius vector, the same thing is true at the periapsis, OK? So um, basically, the lesson is uh, it is easy to calculate the angular momentum at the periapsis or the apoapsis. And the reason is um, these are the only places where the velocity is perpendicular to r. Any other place in the orbit, these two would have some angle between them. Um, okay, so if we take the formula for the magnitude of angular momentum, which is normally m v perp r, we don't need to calculate the perpendicular component because it's already perpendicular. Okay, so this equation just becomes m v r at the apoapsis or the periapsis. So we don't have to do trigonometry to get the perpendicular component at periapsis and apoapsis. We don't have to find the angle. So that makes it much simpler. So, uh, use and, and by the way, um, the gravitational force doesn't exert a torque. Okay? Um, so the angular momentum is conserved in this case. And we have um, the angular momentum at periapsis is equal to the angular momentum at apoapsis. All right? So that means that m speed at periapsis, radius at periapsis, equals m speed at apoapsis, radius at 
apoapsis. And then, of course, the m cancels out because it's the same planet. So we have that this equation is true. Now, this equation is really nice because if we know the shape of the orbit, if we know the periapsis and the apoapsis distances, we can calculate the, the speed. Okay? So um, now what that means is that the, the um, sort of the more eccentric the orbit is, that means that there's going to be a larger difference between the periapsis and the apoapsis, the greater the um, difference in speed between the two. Okay. Now if we think about this um, just in terms of MVR equals a constant, we can see that as the r goes down, the speed has to go up. Okay, so the the planet is going to be going at its fastest at periapsis. All right. Um, so this this is a question that often appears on the on the AP exam in particular. I've also seen it on the IB, but in particular in the AP Physics C, they'll have you calculate relative speeds at periapsis versus apoapsis. And you would use angular momentum conservation to do that. So I think that's kind of nice. All right. Um, let's do another example. Um, the core of a star can be considered to be a rigid body. All right. So a, a star, just like a planet, you know, a planet has the crust, it has the mantle, it has the core. Okay. Um, a, a star has um, a uh, number of layers too. It has the, you know, um, the core, the star is a core, and that's the place where nuclear fusion is uh, happening. And then outside of that, it has what's called the radiation zone. Um, and then outside of that, it has the convection zone. And then it has the photosphere. Um, maybe I'm getting the names and the orders of those wrong, but um, I think those are right. Uh, so, and that has to do with the way that energy is transferring f between the layers of the star, okay? Um, so the core can be considered a rigid body. So because it's a rigid body, we know that the angular momentum of the core is going to be given by I omega, okay? Um, the inertia of a sphere... is given by of a, a solid sphere, I should say, is 2 fifths m r squared. Okay, um, so let's suppose we have a star. All right, now basically all stars are spinning. So this star is spinning. Um, so here it is, it's spinning. And then at the center of the star, there's a core. All right, so here's the core of the star. And the core is also spinning. Um, so what happens is um, in a star at the end of its life is uh, it, it runs out of nuclear fuel, okay? So now why doesn't a star shrink? And it's because there is a nuclear fusion happening in the core, and that nuclear fusion pushes the outside of the star out. So the reason that a star is so big is because of all of that energy that's pushing the star out, okay? So once the star runs out of fuel, okay, um, once the star runs out of fuel, uh, 
the entire star will start to collapse and fall towards the center. Okay. Um, and so as a result of that, the core of the star gets compressed. Okay. So the core of the star gets compressed to much smaller than it was before. All right. Um, okay. But it can't compress forever. So what happens is the... Um, uh, what happens is that the outer atmosphere of the star collapses, it compresses the core, eventually the core doesn't compress anymore, and it, um, the outer atmosphere actually bounces off the core and gets sent outward, okay? So the core, the atmosphere of the star, gets flung outward when it bounces off of the core. Okay, and that is a, what's known as a supernova explosion. Okay, um, and then during that bounce, the core gets compressed even further. So the core shrinks in size. All right, um, but it doesn't lose its angular momentum. So, so the core, so now let's talk about the angular momentum of the core of the star during a supernova, all right? So the core collapses. So we have initial angular momentum, I initial omega initial, is equal to final angular momentum, I final omega final, all right? Um, the initial inertia is 2 fifths m r initial squared. And I'm using the rigid body form of angular momentum. All right. Um, the final. Um, the final inertia is two fifths m r final squared. So r final is less than r initial. Now, the, the mass of the core hasn't changed, so we have uh, two-fifths m cancels out. And what we end up getting is um, r initial squared times omega initial equals r final squared times omega final. Okay, so this is an expression of conservation of angular momentum for the core of a star. Okay. And basically, um, you know, if we just think about this as r squared omega equals a constant, what this is saying is that as the core shrinks, its spin rate goes up. So neutron stars, what's wrong, Hazel? I can just tell she's going to have an accident. I'm going to take a nap this afternoon, and I'm going to wake up to disaster. I can already tell. She's, she's letting me know. She's just sitting right here and just panting and staring at me. She's saying, you're going to hate me after I do this. Um, so uh, basically, the core is spinning really fast. So here's, the, here's a bigger view of the neutron star. Uh, so, you know, it, it might, the core might collapse to a spinning black hole. And if it does that, it's called a, a Kerr black hole, K-E-R-R -R black hole. Um, that's the name for a rotating black hole. If it's not rotating, it's called a Schwarzschild black hole. Or, uh, depending on the mass of the outer atmosphere, it might not have enough mass to compress it into a black hole, in which case it becomes a neutron star. So neutron stars tend to be uh, spinning very fast as a result of this. Okay. Um, now, one of the interesting things about this is sometimes you get a situation where when the neutron star collapses, um, its magnetic poles are not aligned with the rotation axis. So the north and south pole, the magnetic north and south pole of the neutron star 
is not aligned with the um, the rotation axis. So it's kind of like a bar magnet that's spinning like this. All right. Um, and if you spin a bar magnet fast enough, and neutron stars are spinning fast, they're a very strong magnet, it will actually emit electromagnetic radiation, also known as light. Okay. Um, so every time the north pole of the neutron star faces the Earth, we get a pulse of electromagnetic radiation. Okay, um, and so a rotating neutron star with its magnetic axis deviating from its rotation axis is called a pulsar. Okay, um, and they, they pulse electromagnetic radiation every time the North Pole faces the Earth. Um, now there are some neutron stars that don't look like pulsars because their magnetic axis is basically aligned with the rotation axis. So that basically the more powerful the neutron star is, the more unaligned they are. So it's kind of a more extreme rotation of the magnet. Um, but it's kind of interesting because we observe neutron stars and we observe pulsars and we didn't know that they were the same thing until we better understood stellar physics. Um, they're actually the same thing, just with different degrees of alignment. Um, OK? Now, another interesting thing about pulsars is that their rate of rotation is really steady. So you could actually use pulsars as a very accurate clock. But because of the effects, of general relativity, the pulsar, as it's spinning, actually drags space-time around with it. And so uh, what that does is some of the energy of rotation of the pulsar is transferred to space-time itself, and it's emitted as gravitational waves, OK? Um, so because some of the energy of the pulsar goes into emitting these gravitational waves, uh, the the um, the rotation rate of the pulsar will gradually slow down, okay? And so we have actually been able to measure the rotation period of the pulsar and very accurately determine the rate at which it's slowing down. And the rate at which they slow down is consistent with what is predicted by general relativity. So this is actually one of the tests of general relativity, is looking at the rate of pulsars slowing down their spinning. It's kind of neat. All right. Um, there is one more type of problem that I wanted to talk about just really briefly. Um, this problem is not as interesting as, as orbiting planets or pulsars or anything like that. But it is kind of um, important. Uh, and I talked about this type of problem last year as well. Uh, what if I have two spinning disks? Okay, and those two disks share the same axis. Okay, so both of these disks are spinning. Um, this disk has an angular momentum of I1 times omega 1. This disk has an angular momentum of I2 times omega 2. All right? So they're spinning at different rates. They, are, they have different inertias. So the initial angular momentum is going to be the sum of those two. All right? The initial angular momentum is going to be the sum of those two. Um, then suppose we drop the top disk onto the bottom disk. So now you have these two disks are spinning together. So because the disks are in contact, eventually they're going to have the same omega. Okay. Um, there would be a lot of friction if they were spinning at different rates. So eventually... So the friction will basically force them to spin at the same rate. 
So um, what do we do with the inertias? Well, we add the two inertias together because they're basically one object now. And so we can use this statement of angular momentum conservation to calculate the final spin rate once they collide with each other. So that's a common problem is two things collide and we want to know how fast are they spinning after they collide. All right. Um, so that's how you might do a problem such as that. Well, that is my lesson for today, so I will see you.